Welcome everybody to this very special webinar today with the author of I Don't Agree, Michael Brown, and his special guests, Jules Chappell and Ash Alexander Cooper. I'm Tessa Gooding, Communications Director of the IPA, and I'm particularly excited to be introducing this webinar because having read the book, I loved it and thought it was hugely insightful for how to live your life well. So we were delighted when Michael agreed to share more of his thinking with us and for you to get a 35% discount on the book. My role today is to introduce you to everyone and then hand over to Michael before summarising key thoughts as we close. So let me start by introducing Michael. Michael knows the advertising and marketing business well. He was MD of the experiential agency Beatwax for 12 years before a spectacular falling out that made trade press boss quits headlines. He then went on to form marketing, a new agency with global ambitions, determined to be a better leader. He's still their MD today. As he will tell you, he's learned about conflict resolution the hard way, but unlike most of us, he got interested in how people tick and turned a potentially disastrous career moment into a new business opportunity that got acquired by Dentsu. He's also the man behind the Whitfield Street Soup Kitchen Mental Health Drop-In Centre. So this is our author. Welcome, Michael. You may already know Jules because she is MD at London and & Partners and led the rollout of the Great Campaign. Much of her background on conflict resolution has been on the front line as a British diplomat, where it is sometimes a matter of life and death. She has served in Jordan, Iraq, America, Ethiopia and Guatemala, where she was British ambassador. At London and Partners, she is responsible for telling London's story and for the teams that attract and retain foreign investment. So she knows about keeping the peace and about business, especially how to foster economic prosperity. Thank you, Jules, for joining us today. Ash has another extraordinary CV. He served as a colonel in the British Army and has represented the UK as a successful athlete, amongst other things. During his 22-year career in the military, he became one of the most operationally experienced officers of his generation, spending 82 months leading some of the world's most elite forces in complex and hostile environments, including the Balkans, the Middle East and Central Asia. Today, Ash uses these skills to help businesses and leaders develop the skills and behaviours necessary to adapt and win. Ash is dialing in from Australia, where I believe it's very early in the morning. So good morning, Ash. So this is your panel. who will be chaired by Michael, who wants you to ask lots of questions. So please make sure you load these on the Q&A button. I also need to tell you that this webinar is being recorded and will be accessible again through the IPA website in a day or two. We have an hour, 35 minutes of which will be the panel discussion. So that's enough from me, over to you, Michael. Thank you, Tessa, that was um, an amazing introduction. As you unrolled that, it became immediately apparent to me that uh, my CV just was paled by comparison to Jules and, uh, and Ash here. Um, so I'll try to play catch up with the remainder of my career inspired by you two guys. Um, thanks for joining me, Jules and Ash. Um, being in a state of disagreement, it's a, it's, it's a natural human condition, isn't it? Yet we're not so good at, it, good at it, really. There's a hell of a lot of shouting going on right now out there in the world, which is interesting in, in, in context of COVID. And you think about the early days of that crisis, we'd sort of rediscovered our kindness gene, we were clapping our curers on the doorstep, and we were talking about community. But now, a few weeks down the line, I guess, brought on by the tension of all being locked up, um, another world view is taking shape. There's a lot more shouting. We seem to be falling out and we don't appear to be listening to each other. Lots and lots of arguments and lots of debates about lots of different subjects, which are all covered in the book. But essentially, if you want to change the world, you're almost certainly going to be a, a come across somebody with a different and conflicting opinion to you. You're going to be opposed to another's world view. Which means, I guess, to move forward, you, you need to take a proper, wider perspective to imagine yourselves in the shoes of others, people who are from different backgrounds, different cultures, have been enculturated in, in different ways to you. 
you have to sort of deploy, I guess, your empathy gene to properly understand what makes those people tick and to, want, and to understand really why they, that they're opposed to your worldview. Which is, I think, why I'm here with the IPA. Um, because to properly imagine yourselves in someone else's shoes is a, is a creative exercise, isn't it? We're all in the creative industries. Solving conflict is a creative exercise and a failure to take perspective. It's a bit of a failure of imagination, isn't it? Which in our line of work is a, is a heinous crime. So our creative firepower doesn't always have to be lined up to sell something. It could also be used to save the world, essentially, which I'm not claiming that I don't agree will save the world. Uh, that might be an overclaim. But what I'm hoping to achieve with it is to sort out organisational culture. There's a lot of flawed organisational culture in the world. Um, so I'm looking at it from a business perspective. But then if you think about all human endeavour, it's, it's all organised. So in one sense, if you sort out organisational culture, you could, with a fair wind, to, um, sort out the world. Which brings me, I guess, to my guest speakers, um, uh, Ash and Jules. Um, they both very generously contributed to, to the book. And by the nature of their past professions, they've both been very active in conflict resolution in actual conflict zones. My particular uh, role in life requires no body armour. Um, and what constitutes a life and death situation to me is actually not really a life and death situation at all in reality. But when it comes to Jules and Ash, um, use of the imagination, creative problem solving, putting yourself in an other's perspective, and not only vital to achieving a role, but it's also instrumental in preserving a life. And I think very much their own lives in, in some situations. So, um, so that's where I wanted to start with. Um, I'm, 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 I'm going to pick on Jules Fair, sorry Jules, um, and because obviously in asking you to contribute I got you to read the book and I was obviously waited for some time thinking I hope she likes it um, and, um, and then in, in order to start with conflict uh, in my own role, in my own fallings out, I had to go back to childhood uh, and look at uh, sibling rivalry, childhood conflict, family dynamics, and I came across an, uh, an American academic called Laurie Kramer, who studies all of those things. And, uh, and she, um, according to her work and her, um, her tranches of research, um, she said that kids between the age of three to seven uh, fall out on average three times an hour for every waking hour. And moreover, that takes about 10 minutes of every hour for every waking hour. And I thought, well, hang on a minute, what if I do the maths on that? She hadn't done the maths, so I did the maths and it's in the book. And you go three times an hour, how, how, many hour, how, how many hours to sleep the kids need? That's about 10 according to the NHS. So 14 times three times three, six, five times five years. That's 89,000 conflict exchanges. And that's, that really does give us all a firm footing um, and a lot of practice in falling out with each other. And um, when I put that to you, Jules, um, and you, you, you looked about it in, in context of, uh, of, of your own uh, exchanges between your own kids, and you thought that they might be rapidly approaching that figure and uh, becoming hardwired, if you like, for conflict. Um, and, um, and you were potentially worried that your offspring may not be as di diplomatically inclined as you, their diplomat mum. And you tried a bit of the collaborative problem solving uh, from the book. Can you just tell us a little bit about that experience, Jules? Yeah, I, I genuinely am grateful to you, Michael, because uh, 89,000, I think I was rapidly approaching that figure uh, within a few weeks of lockdown. Um, so to put it in the context, I am mum to four-year-old twins. Uh, they are both insanely competitive, and I really don't know where they get that from. Um, but within lockdown, uh, it felt like what was normal behaviour was becoming increasingly agitated, um, which I'm sure, you know, for any parent out there, they'll feel that just because they weren't getting the normal amount of release that they would. Um, and I found myself stepping in. So it's that kind of sort them out. So you would step in and whatever it is that they were crying about, you would fix the situation. So I was, you know, one of them was crying because they had the toy that the other one wanted. And I was just doing whatever, quite frankly, would solve the situation as quickly as possible. And then I read your book and it did make me really step back and think because at no stage was I giving them the chance to solve the problem themselves. And so they were increasingly used to just flipping off at the slightest thing and expecting mommy or daddy to come in and, and fix it for them. 
and, and quite often playing up to it. So like it was even more dramatic because they wanted to get my attention and they wanted me to come in and fix it. And I shifted from that to admittedly what was a painfully slow process to start off with, which is to, to literally sit them down and say, right, their names are Charlotte and Lily. Charlotte, why do you think Lily is so upset? Lily, why do you think Charlotte is so upset? How do you think that Lily feels? Lily, how do you think that Charlotte feels? How do you think that we can make Lily feel better? Lily, how do you think we can make Charlotte feel better? Does anybody have any ideas as to what we could do to make you both feel happy? And it, it really, I know it's going to sound so um, sort of theoretical, but it really worked. It really, really worked. And then they started getting competitive about who could fix the situation with the best idea. So then it was like, well, maybe if I go get a bigger unicorn from upstairs or whatever it was, but it was extraordinary. And I found myself, the more that I did it, the more I started to find them doing it on their own. So Lily, why are you sad? How can I make that better for you? And, I, and I, honestly, it took weeks. I'm not going to pretend it was an easy thing. Um, and I, there were definitely still times when I was stressed with something and I'd find myself just going in and trying to fix the problem and retreating back. But it genuinely worked. But it was more the point that it made me realize that um, you're right, that it's hardwired. We're used to other people coming in and sorting it out rather than taking that pragmatic approach and learning to empathize from a very young age rather yep. than having someone else sort the problem out. Absolutely. Um, thanks, Jules. Uh, yeah, uh, a couple of the things you described, previous uh, processes. So in, in past, uh, in, in Laurie, going back to Laurie Kramer's work, um, she describes the normal response of parents is to, um, in, in two categories. One is sounds like it could be good parenting. It's passive non-intervention, which is literally doing nothing. Uh, and the other one is command and control. We, it's just an authoritarian approach. We say, you'll do as I say with no explanation. And obviously collaborative problem solving is, is, is the way forward. So, uh, so the book is a 10 step guide. So it, 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 it sort of flicks through all of these various life stages. So fast forwarding to, to, into your, further into your uh, life or, pr or more correctly going back Jules actually. Um, um, there's there's um, one of the last major collaboration projects we've yet to succeed with in the world and it's a continued source of conflict is actually gender equality. Um, uh, and when you were ambassador in Guatemala, you made domestic violence, key part of your mission. And later in, when you was in Iraq, your specific aim was getting local women in, into politics. And obviously that involved a lot of meetings. And I imagine that was a fairly patriarchal society. So taking perspective um, in, in that might be, uh, might be a difficult thing. Um, but when it came to meetings, you had some anecdotes around there, you had a firm um, perspective on how meetings should be run. And I, I'd read a book in part of my research called Feminist Fight Club by uh, Jessica Bennett. And in that she describes the, the, the very negative experiences of, of women in meetings just all over the world. And again, I did the maths on, on how many meetings there are in the world. And in America, there are 55 million a day. And I thought if you amplify that around the world, that's a continued source of conflict for 50% of the working population who have very bad experiences in these meetings when it comes to the equality conversation. It's on things like men talking over women, expecting women to take notes and all those kind of things that um, and you can Google all that and it's all there. Um, and, but you had a very firm way of, uh, of, 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 of thinking about how meetings should be run when you was in Iraq and maybe you could touch on that as well, Jules, for us. Yeah, well, I think the, the point I was making was that very often the discussions I was um, sitting at were, were just not representative of the issues that were being talked about. So I was finding that we were talking about how to resolve an issue that was affecting a community. And yet very often the people who were suffering most from whatever the issue were, were, were not at the table. And worse, there were actually people at the table who were sort of incentivized to keep the problem going. So um, I used to do a lot with uh, the Somalia peace talks and I, I hope no one reminds me of Chatham House rules or whatever, but, but it was extraordinary how many people were effectively making quite a good living out of the ongoing peace talks. And I couldn't help but think were some of the, you know, uh, communities who were directly suffering the violence, who didn't walk out of a meeting room with, with security and support. If they had been at the table, um, I just know that we would have got to results quicker. Whereas quite often I felt that we were negotiating beautifully, very smart 
pros that had on paper ways of fixing things and fixing views but none of that heartfelt this has got to stop because it is directly affecting me or it's directly affecting my children and and that's what what would make me very passionate was that, that you know how often do we really especially back in the business world when we quite often just are running from meeting to meeting to meeting how often do we really genuinely sit down and think right who's not at this table who needs to be at this table yeah who's who's incentivized how are they incentivized and how do we get that raw passion and that desire to genuinely fix something because it really matters to that person so on staying on that subject jules then there was um the, the step five is, is called woman up um and I, I, I guess I trade on a lot of research that suggests there's a lot of areas in business where uh, women are better at men um, in, in, some, in some of the finer arts of business. And I reference loads of it in the book and obviously time doesn't permit me to, to drag it all out here. Um, but there was um, a Zenga Folkman, an American research company, who'd, uh, who'd surveyed 16,000 uh, uh, leaders, CEOs around the world for Barclays Bank and University of Cambridge. And um, they found that, for instance, uh, female CEOs tended to be more profitable than male CEOs. So that's interesting. And then in context of that, there was some new science around uh, the fight flight response and, uh, and how that works out in, in, in a business context, your response to stress and how that might split by gender. And there's a whole load of science, new science around uh, around about the year 2000, coming out of California, um, which suggests uh, uh, female leaders respond to stress in different ways, and they renamed that ten befriend, uh, so not fight or flight. And it transpired that the fight or flight research, clinical research done in 1932 by Professor Walter Cannon, all of the clinical research was done on men only, amazingly. So lots of assumptions made about um, how uh, everybody responds to conflict, yet only men were in these studies, which is amazing. Um, and uh, there, was, there, was, um, there was a UN report I read about fe female leadership in politics, which drew similar, con similar con conclusions. Um, and obviously there's been much media commentary, Jules, of late about female leadership in responding to the COVID crisis better. So obviously immediately springing to mind in that is uh, Jacinda Ardern. So, You've been super effective in both in, in both business and highly politicised situations. So, what's what's your view? Can can male leadership figures lead to woman up, so to speak, if if you like? Um, well, I should I should start by saying that I'm coached by an amazing neuroscientist called Tara Swart, who always teaches me about neuroplasticity. So, I firmly believe that we are all capable of of empathy and of um, you know, irrespective of of gender. So. I, I think perhaps it's useful just to talk through my own experience of this um, because I've served in places where law and order has broken down and I've been in situations where you, you the, the, it's palpable, danger is palpable and I felt that acutely um, also specifically because of my gender and, and felt scared, you know, scared because um, yeah, scared of sexual violence and, and of not being physically as, as strong. Now, again, that's not exclusive. There will be many men who felt this as well, but, but it's really, um, when I was thinking about it, it is extraordinary how it affects you because when I think through it, my reaction uh, when I was going through those experiences is to, is to try and almost be invisible. You want to be as small as you possibly can. You don't want to, um, you don't want to have eye contact you you're very acutely aware of what everybody else is doing their behavior their emotions um, and at all costs you're avoiding confrontation and if it comes up then you are calming confrontation and that stems from my my physical fear um, so when you talk about response to stress and tend to befriend i have that personal lived experience of when law and order breaks down and we get back to a kind of raw human without the the privileges of of society and legal structures etc that's how i retreated to being and it has had categorically an effect on me ever since i've had ptsd i don't mind saying it but in the way that i then diplomatically approach um absolutely it is that tend 
befriend and it is the empathy and it's it, these are heightened partly because uh, of the experiences that I've gone through but I do think about you know there are many many how much is that historically so and how how has that heightened that uh, ability to to calm confrontation I don't know I'm not a scientist but I've certainly lived the experience myself and and turned it to an advantage but I can also see where some of it comes from which is which is a negative but uh, yeah absolutely thanks Jules for that Ash I'm going to draw you into the conversation now sir um and I know it's one it's it's past one in Australia so I'm conscious I need to bring you in so that I don't stop you from dropping off um so Ash, go on, on perspective taking, when I, 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 as part of my interview for the book in your section in the book, I asked you what qualities might actually hold you back, if you like, when, when trying to reach a resolve in, in an actual conflict zone. And you reacted really, really quickly with, and I'm putting it in inverted commas, being tone deaf. And uh, uh, I, I understood that to mean that if you suffer in such a way, uh, taking perspective is, is a difficult thing. So could you expand uh, on that, give an example and, and actually some advice in, in, in how to avoid it? Yeah, I think it's something that happens quite often where, you know, we are selected for positions, you know, in, in Jules as well, in ambassadorial roles or in military leadership roles or liaison roles. You're, you're selected for the things that you've done well in your own culture in, in a sort of different environment quite often. And therefore, there's a risk that when you enter these quite often very alien environments, you, you take those perspectives with you. And I think what I always had to do very consciously was to really connect with that sort of cultural empathy gene and understanding gene and take time to do homework and understand who it was that I was going to meet and what might be the drivers that would cause them publicly or privately to behave in or speak in the way that they did. Because quite often the public language would be very different from what they actually felt personally but they were required to portray a certain image or behave in a certain way and, and we kind of are at risk of not thinking in a, in a nuanced enough way about what might be causing people to, to to do what they do so if you don't think about that you know cultural empathy and environment into which you you are placed then you can you risk making fundamental errors quite early on that can be quite hard to recover from um, and and therefore I found that not only would I have to do the you know, the, the family tree almost, do the research to find out who's married to who and whose sister is, you know, who who left who and who's cheating on, you know, just the kind of the soap opera stuff is really, really important. And it's quite hard to do, but, um, you know, people do love to gossip quite often in the places I've been. So you can get quite a lot of information quite quickly. But then once you've, you know, you're in the room and, and it's your role then to try and mediate or understand and, and get people to do the things that you need, you know, to make a positive impact, you have to not only listen but read the room you know look at body language and this is something that not everywhere i've been i you know jules is far cleverer than i in terms of being able to speak many languages i'm sure um but i don't speak all the languages of all the places i've been you know i can understand enough of of um uh, dari or pashto just from being in afghanistan for a lot of time um for example but body language is is absolutely key and um and so much is conveyed in those non-verbal ways and therefore knowing what sort of things might be going on in that environment are really important and there's, there's one example i think we talked about in the book where a new boss arrived who was a boss to me sort of mid-level i suppose or senior-ish um commander and it was his first time in afghanistan in that in that level of, of role he'd not been there for many many years and this was his chance to make a you know, you know report back to his his own sort of western chain of command how well he was doing and how he understood the situation and i, and I was asked to take him to meet some senior locals that i had deep relationships with and you know as is the way you sit down and you chit chat you can't get much done in the first many meetings really it's just tea and, and chatting and we had the first cup of tea and then they politely asked us if we wanted a second cup of tea which is pretty standard and then things started I just started to get the spidey senses that you know we were needing to leave now not not in a, an aggressive way that made me feel nervous but it was just clearly time from the cues that I was picking up on that we there was nothing more to say in that meeting we it had run its course and they very made a big song and dance about offering a third cup of tea. And this boss of mine thought, oh, this, is go this is going brilliantly. So they, you know, we're, we're obviously best mates already. And so he accepted the third cup of tea and you could see this collective rolling of eyes around the room. And I'm just 
sitting there thinking, oh God, this is awkward. Um, and so we duly finished the third cup of tea. And, and as we were leaving, I was summoned back in immediately by the minister and said, don't ever bring him here again, please. I've got work to do. Um, and it was just that, you know, and, and afterwards when I got back to the car, you know, my boss said that went brilliantly. I mean, three cups of tea. Amazing. It's like, yeah, yeah, you have no idea. Um, so yeah, different but perspectives. Because that, well, obviously one of the, uh, again, in the research for the book, uh, you, you have to take a leap out of my own Westernness, if you like, and look at other cultures. And, and the thing I liked about that was that, um, um, as I as I delve deeper into it, that um, your your boss there had no um, understanding of the the uh, Muslim obligation to hospitality, regardless of whether you're Muslim or not, and uh, and obviously the rules, the 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 social rules within that, and yeah, he, he read it in one way, and the, and locally it was meant as another, and I just think those cultural disconnects and jars, uh, when amplified, can actually go a long way to explaining. A lot of the conflict that exists in the world so if you take that as the departure point of a potential falling out it's just a it's a small thing isn't it but over time those kind of things can uh, uh, become amplified and, and the conflict and the gaps uh, between perspectives get wider so again it is about a failure isn't it in, in that instance i think to take perspective um and, and staying on you ash as well just while we're on the subject there's um uh there's there's a step eight in the book is it, it's actually called go east and it's a it's about how to make the leap of imagination from the culture that we're born into and, and again to escape if you like and used it before and you used it ash the term west our westernness and how to acculturate if you like to all the perspectives and then and this was interesting and, and a little bit worrying in in, in in context of the diverse uh, population and the way we're all uh, you know we all mix together globally in the way the world has got smaller and there was a western academic i started reading um called Samuel P. Huntingdon. And if you Google him, you'll find he authored a, um, a, a very well regarded in academic circles um, work called The Clash of Cultures Theory, and essentially predicted that all future conflict will actually be about cultural identity. And that is really interesting in context of what's going on right now in, th in terms of all, all manners of how we understand identity, gender obviously being, being, being one of those, the spectrum of gender by which I mean. Um, so I thought that was interesting. And then I, there was, and keep and staying in Afghanistan then, for, for you, Ash, you also told me about um, a very, what I understood to be a very pronounced uh, cultural disconnect, which was um, how time is diced and sliced, I, I guess. And, uh, it's, and there was a particular phrase, which I love, and I think should be the subject of, or the title of your next, or your first book, Ash, um, which, uh, can you tell us about that? And uh, how to, to tell us that, local phrase and uh, and what it sort of means yeah, so, i mean they i found certainly in afghanistan and there are other you know locations in that sort of part of the world that i think have a very similar viewpoint where the time horizons are just you know could not be more different to our own and a phrase that we heard often was you know you might have all the watches but we have all the time and they would think in afghanistan very generation generationally you know feuds last generations and you know they're not in a rush necessarily to make a deal just because we are only there for six months or 12 months and we need to demonstrate progress for our, you know, um, from our perspective in that time. So and I saw this day in, day out in, in the many, you know, I spent nearly four years in Afghanistan um, at the time when I, when I finally left was 10% of my life when I added it up when I left it. So early 40s had been spent there. Um, but, but it happened over and over where we're, we were, I wouldn't say incentivized, but we're required to sort of demonstrate progress on a campaign, you know, and in, in terms of the Afghan campaign, it's now, you know, in hindsight being referred to as, um, you know, 19 um, single sort of wars as it were, rather than one 19 year war, just every, every year, there'd be something different. It just happened again and again. And you could see the fatigue on the locals faces when yet another enthusiastic young Western officer came in or young diplomat saying, we're going to change the world. And they're like, well, you've only got six months so I doubt it um so for me that's why I kept on going back in in many ways because I recognized um well first of all I love the country and I love the people and I really you know had a an empathy with them that you know I've got many lifelong friends you know genuinely um to this day from that time spent but I recognized unless we were committed to going back again and again and again and building on those relationships, you'd never actually achieve lasting success because they would just wait. If they didn't like what you were saying and you didn't go about it in an empathetic or understanding way, they just wait you out. 
six months to them and that generational mindset means nothing. <laughs> They're quite happy to wait until the next officer comes and if they can do business with him or her, then that would be easier. Um, so there's a lot of pride, you know, we might, and we, we did often as a Western coalition, and we've done this in other countries as well, come in as the most technologically, technologically advanced, you know, coalition. And they are, you know, seen often by the West as being primitive fighters, but in their minds, they have never lost. They didn't lose to Russia. They hadn't lost to the US or anyone else. So we have to just, again, think about how they view conflict as well. Um, and we risk getting it very, very wrong if we don't stop and think. Absolutely. And, and, and when it came to switching perspectives, because um, I, I remember in, the in, in, in some of the interviews, Ash, you did talk about how you were perceived to flip to a sort of an Eastern perspective, if you like, or, or something that was other than, uh, the, than Westernness. And, um, and you, you described some situations, I don't know if it, sensitivities may not allow you to repeat them here, but when, you know, when you visited a compound, making sure you were unarmed and those kind of things. I just thought they were, you were taking a perspective, uh, a potentially dangerous perspective flip and were trying to um, uh, put yourself in the shoes of dissimilar others, if you like. Could you elaborate on that a little? Yeah, so um, a lot of the work I did, particularly in Afghanistan, was I found myself on my own um, with an interpreter, but he was always unarmed. And, and therefore, you know, you, one could argue that you're at quite a lot of risk. You know, it wouldn't take a lot to overpower an individual, you know, working completely in... Uh, with locals in a compound where there were, you know, in some cases, thousands of, of locals, many of whom you, you didn't know who they were at all. Um, so for me, my protection from any threats was to make it very clear that I trusted my hosts, even though, you know, in terms of how straight they could shoot or how well they could protect me might be questionable. The protection that I got from demonstrating that I trusted them to do what was necessary to look after me and, and conversely, that they could trust me to look after them as well. If there was an attack, I would be the first person to, to try and you know, protect them. Um, and there'd be probably a bit of a competition to see who could protect each other the best. Um, but what it meant I needed to do was to get to know everybody from the, the lady that made the tea, the gardener, everybody from the moment I arrived in the camp all the way through up to the minister. And it would take a, you know, quite a long time to get to the meetings quite often and quite a long time to leave. But it was really valuable time spent to get to know people and connect. And my, you know, generals and ministers commented on it often. You know, why are you talking to the tea lady? She's, she's just the tea lady. And you say, well, actually, you know, she's, there's a new baby in the family and, you know, her kids are just doing exams. And you could see them sort of surprised that anybody would be remotely interested in talking to anybody other than the leader, um, you know, who you were supposed to be meeting for that particular meeting. But for me on my own, it meant that, you know, getting to connect with them and have friends all the way up the chain was really, really important. And they could see you as, as human and not just the sort of superior uh, or to perceive yourself as superior. I never wore sunglasses. I never wore overtly any body armor. I was always armed, but my pistol would be sort of hidden under my shirt so that they could see that overtly, at least, I presented no threat. And I, it was that sort of pure um, trust that was really, really important for, for the work I was doing. Thanks, Ash. Um, wow, wow. Um, yeah, when it comes to when it comes to uh, you know our day jobs and you know we as people in the creative industries uh, you know we have a, we have a client uh, you know we may have a, a you know a client problem you know maybe the campaign's not gone so well and we tend to think about uh, you know we, we look at that in, in a life and death context in many ways and we, we overreact to it but um, um, so yeah this does uh, sort of uh, temper um, uh, uh, our everyday experience of business conflict absolutely um, it just part of the research I, I found there's loads of fascinating stuff um, around reaching a resolve and going back to my, uh, my, my, my watershed moment, if you like, my epiphany was, you know, going back to that spectacular falling out um, uh, with my former business partners and, uh, and, and what a, um, a, the, the spectacular fireworks display, if you like, of red hot emotions on the office floor for which there was not much dignity, I have to say. Um, in the, in the, um, in the, I guess, the period of reflection immediately after that, one of the things that kept coming back to me was actually have my, did my partners have a position in this argument that was at least as valid as mine? And I have to come, I had to, it took me a while to get it, but I had to concede that absolutely, um, uh, uh, they did. And one of the things that was holding me back from that was my failure, if you like, to understand this psychological phenomena which is called attribution bias and it, it exists in it's been, it was termed that back in the 50s by many psychologists and that is in any dispute um, the the parties on either side of the dispute 
um, have a tendency to blame the deadlocks that arise in that on the other side. So essentially, it's you know, it's the other side blaming the other and vice versa. And there's no way through that. And it's it's actually called attribution bias. And at the same time, um, for any credits and any successes that can be accrued to the negotiation are also uh, taken by both sides, if you like. So there's the, you know that minefield of, of human psychology, behavior, hardwired behaviors, the, the inability to, to take perspective has is, is been a 10 year journey for me really. And it definitely was helped along the way by, uh, by, by you guys in terms of, you know, you guys resolved conflict in actual conflict zones. And, um, and again, some of those conversations, and I'll be honest with you, Ash, have been, in, you know, di have been difficult for, for me because, you know, when it came to the Iraq thing, for instance, I, I was one of the million people who, who marched on Parliament with my children to say stop the war, and uh, back in two thousand and three, um, and and you know the government, the, you know, that fell on deaf ears, um, and um, and I also learned that there's a phenomenon uh, 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 that, that that you could, uh, which is about attribution uh, uh, bias, but um, um, but the 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 the, the um, so the, the government failing to take perspective of the people and and looking at the wider coalition so it was a it was a difficult thing for me to take your perspective as uh, as well Ash. yeah so and I, i'm struggling around that because i'm trying to be very 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 sensitive but um but i feel i've learned so much from you absolutely um so i, I think I'm, I'm looking at the time here and um and I think it's fair to say, I'm going to ask both of you questions. I'm going to sort of wanting to feel, uh, sort of play it off each other, really, because it's, um, it's um, I think it's absolutely correct to say, and as we've learned, that um, you, you, you two know a thing or two about high stakes negotiations. So absolutely perspective taking and absolutely creative problem solving. So going back to the audience or in, 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 in the creative industries. Um, so are there any rituals that you have in a, a head of a negotiation or resolution is that you know any any stylistic tips and i know you've given us something uh on that uh, as we progress through this uh, through this webinar but is there anything specific that you can that the, the people watching from home can actually take home and practice and I'll, I'll start with you on that jules if you don't mind yeah yeah so i was thinking about so i've got um three tips the first is, is the ritual that I will do, um, which goes back to something that I got taught actually in my foreign office interview, uh, which is to take a deep breath or go for a shower, like run. Those are things I do to clear my head and then to argue through the whole thing from the other person's point of view and to argue against yourself. So you have to start on the basic premise that most people believe something for a set of reasons. So what, what is that? Why? Um, and then you go through the whole expected negotiation. So I pretend to be the other person, I argue, I then put forward my point of view, I argue it back, I argue it back. And, and this is something that you do as a civil servant is you're advising government, you're not taking decisions, but it's your job to see it from every possible angle, including the people who you are likely to be talking to. Um, I would then take that logic and I would ask other people, Again, what have I missed? What am I not thinking of? Why would they potentially think that? Is there, is there something else that I'm not thinking about? So that's how I would prepare for any, and do prepare for any high state negotiation, but constantly putting myself in the person who I'm going to negotiate with point of view. The second thing is that I, I need to keep myself on track. Things will always get very complex. So it's boiling it down to having one thing that I absolutely must come away with, having one thing that I definitely don't mind giving up on, and then having a cherry on top, having something that's never been mentioned before but that I can throw in to help, but always having those three things, but categorically knowing what it is, why I'm there and what it is I really want to come away with and staying very clear. And then the last set of tips is really just thinking about prepping that environment and being human, exactly as Ash said. So, you know, who, who is the team? I hate this kind of idea of, right, we need to dominate, we need to have more people or whatever, like, you know, that kind of, it, it's, it's the opposite of that. It's how can we cut through this to be as human as possible. Um, I've always been struck that when I've done uh, diplomatic negotiations, nearly everything is done outside of the main room. And it's quite often broken down into little one-on-ones or, you know, it literally is, let's go for a walk, let's get out of here. Um, and there's no reason why that can't apply to business as well. Um, and just stripping the 
ego away. And, and it's really hard when you're in formal talks because quite often, you know, the pressure is there on someone to win the point, to be the, you know, so you need to work out ways of stripping that away. And last one, really good biscuits. <laughs> yeah, yeah, party rings are my favorite. Oh, I didn't say that, that's what I, that's what I had in my mind. <laughs> Ash, apart from really good biscuits, um, although we will be interested to know what your favourites are. Um, uh, similarly, are there any uh, tips, rituals? Uh, um, well, Jill's covered, I mean, I love the, 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 having the, those things, the compromise, the cherry on top, those kind of things are very, very helpful as a framework because it's very quick, very easy to get sidetracked or to be taken down rabbit holes, particularly if you're tackling a topic that they don't really want to have to address. You can find all sorts of reasons to talk about anything other than the thing you're after. So maybe if I just talk slightly a little bit more about the sort of style um, and the way I approach things. So for me, again, it, it comes back to what Jules also mentioned about being human and thinking that particularly the more diametrically, diametrically opposed you're likely to be with the person with whom you're, you're engaging or negotiating, trying to sort of forget some of the, uh, the topic issues that would cause that you know, opposition, first of all, and just think of those things that, that make you more similar than than different so you know if they're a parent then I would talk father to father quite often and things that you're told quite often in our training to just don't talk about your families and don't you know it's all it's dangerous to kind of get too personal I found personally the, the opposite to be the case and and finding a way to connect on a human level so right you know if you've got this perspective as a father would you want your kids to grow up in a world if this was the outcome and trying to get them to think about the problem not as the minister or the general who need to, needs to be seen to be strong or whatever, um, but thinking of other ways to get them to just perhaps be open to a different way to think. And I found this in the COVID world, actually, with, um, you know, home Zoom calls and stuff. You know, you've, you're, everybody, I guess, on the call have seen you know, the way to do business normally is you're in, the, you know, the, the meeting room and you're in your suits and everything, it's all very formal. But that has had to be broken down completely during COVID with all the working from home and the number of co-workers trying to show, you know, paintings that they've just done, you know, with potatoes or whatever, you know, it's just, there's a, there's a natural humanity that didn't exist pre COVID in, a, in the way that it does now. And people just accept that this is real life. And I found that to be a really brilliant way to develop much faster trust between people. So I think of everything at the end of every negotiation or conversation of trying to deepen the partnership, and even if these people you wouldn't necessarily choose to have to, you know, they wouldn't be your top of your friends list um, if you had to pick them. But, you know, when you're forced together, thinking of how can I become a better partner for this person, whether it's a thought partner and not seen as an adversary. And I found and in business as well that by thinking of things as partnerships rather than, just, rather than trying to sell a particular thing or an idea, then actually the sale is the result. But thinking of it from a partnership perspective and a human way. Thanks, Ash. They're, they're great. They're insightful. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share one of mine, actually. It's a little odd, I do warn you. Uh, but I think we were talking about, certainly latterly there, Ash, you talked about sort of, you know, a thought exercise of mental preparation. Um, there's some aspects of my character that, you know, that, that don't make me too happy when I, if I care to navel gaze for too long. One of them is my competitive, I am competitive uh, type. I think it's fairly common in, uh, in, in business anyway, but it's how do you rein back on that in, a, in any kind of meeting situation, really, if, if, you know, if you want to win out in a negotiation, regardless of what the negotiation is, you know, what point are you trying to prove? And I found that um, I, if I mentally defrocked myself in, of that, of my, um, I guess, let's call them weaknesses, it, just in advance of, uh, of a meeting, and that served to keep coming back to me in the meeting to prompt me to, to, to roll back on some of those aspects. And the way I did that was the, I imagined, um, I, and I do this all the time, I imagine that just out, because obviously any meeting negotiation takes place in the meeting room, and I imagine just outside the door there's a coat check, cloakroom type thing, and I mentally sort of think about my competitive nature as a garment and take that off, hand it to the coat check, and then... I found it even more powerful if I then imagined the coat check to be my wife, Katie, uh, who sort of, you know, knows, knows and loves me, warts and all. And, uh, you know, I'll give her, the, give her my competitive nature and she might raise an eyebrow and say, no, that's not at all. There are a few other negative qualities, Michael, that you need to take off. So, you know, so I, and that, so I imagined that as a thought exercise. And I found that in the meeting that definitely allows the other personalities, if you like, uh, into the room. And it's just that, that sort of, I guess it's a creative exercise, isn't it? But it works for me. I think 
in terms of rituals, there are lots of people with lots of different, if you, if you Google that, if you think about Steve Jobs, Google his ritual every morning, which is, is an interesting one as well. Um, I think we've rounded up. I've just got a prompt from Kirsty, who's the head of events at, uh, at the IPA, to say that we need to move, um, uh, we need to bring Tessa back in to, uh, to, to move to the questions. Okay. Right, we've got some questions coming through. Um, the first one is probably easier to um, basically direct to Ash because it, it's relevant to what you were talking about earlier, which was, how did you tell your boss that he wasn't welcome again in the room? <laughs> he didn't. Um, and do you think body language is universal? Basically. Yeah, good questions. Um, the first one, I didn't handle it probably as well as I thought. I, I felt that I was pretty good at having good body language with my partners, my local partners, but when it came to my boss, I struggled because he, having taken a very different view of how well the meeting had gone, he badgered me for weeks and weeks. We've got to get back in to see that general. I know it went so well last time. I've got to, you know, I said, well, he's really busy. And I deflected it for a number of weeks until he, he I just had to tackle it head on because I, I wasn't able to dance around it anymore. So I said that general, I've got to be upfront with you. He honestly doesn't want to see you again because he didn't really understand what value you bring I, didn't, I, was, I was slightly more diplomatic but not not hugely not enough clearly um because our relationship became a bit difficult but i just didn't have time to pander to his western needs and his you know, neediness to be seen to be you know adding value when he wasn't um because i was i felt doing quite important work with these locals and we were making progress so you know i i, I said i didn't handle it well and it did ultimately lead to a conversation where he confronted me and said i just don't think you rate me and then my body language of me looking at the floor was, you know, probably spoke volumes. But, you know, I, I couldn't pander to his westernness, I suppose. Um, but yeah, I didn't hand it brilliantly. But the Afghans were grateful because they didn't see him again. And do you think he learned from that? Do you think? Having I don't think so. I think that was a classic case of tone deafness, to be honest. Oh, okay. um, yeah. Well, I suppose there's nothing you can do in that situation, really. Um, and then body language universal. Yes, I think so. I think, like I said, if you don't speak the local language verbally, all the non-verbal stuff is it's just humanity and you can you can demonstrate whether you're you know you're closed you're open i mean i'm not an expert in any of this in sort of academic terms but it seems pretty obvious of how you can you know diffuse situations by just not you know if i turned up in sunglasses body armor helmet to a lot of these meetings as many people used to immediately you can see the sort of hackles go up on on the locals and that, that just doesn't help so demonstrating a bit of vulnerability i think there's a lot of strength in vulnerability Okay, uh, this is the next question is quite a long question, um, which also has a setup. If you consider that your professional moral code is rooted in kindness and consideration for all colleagues from the most senior of execs to the newest juniors, on the basis that everyone has a perspective from which you can learn, how do you negotiate situations personally and externally that arise when trusted confidence of many, many years whose careers you have helped elevate make choices that are unexpected, callous, cutthroat, and damaging to your own career? Wow. It's quite a biggie. That is a big question, isn't it? Who would like that? <laughs> I think we're all going to deflect responsibility <laughs> for answering that. Jules is unmuted. She's clearly up for this one. <laughs> Damn. Um, no, no, it's God. It's a, it's a really difficult one. I mean, I think all I was going to say, quite honestly, is you, you can't possibly expect to win every battle. And I hate to say it, but... I, you know, I, I, Michael, your, your journey around competitiveness, it, it was my husband actually, who has really um, changed my, or taken my ability to empathize and take different perspectives to a whole new level. I think we, you know, everybody's on their own journey and their own realization. I, I am far more effective now um, because I have the emotional maturity to be able to check my own ego and to check my levels of competitiveness but everybody's on a different journey and at different stages of it um and you know some people will will continue to do things that are that are great for them in the short term but you know i always think life life is a marathon not a sprint um and therefore you've just got to take the high road and they will learn you know if you've been kind to them then good on you carry on being the same don't get dragged down is what i would say i think that that's interesting i think i think the answers in in the question actually tessa because yeah the the value of kindness do explore that in the in the in the book and it's about personal values frameworks um and while many of us instinctively know 
we feel it at our core of what, what's wrong uh, or of something feels unfair to us. If we then, if we try to enunciate, if you like, our personal values frameworks, most people struggle with that. So if you look at, if you can then compare yourself to, you know, to corporations who all publish their values um, on their website, in fact, 84 of the FTSE 100 publish a values framework, a significant chunk of the Forbes 1000 does, and the actual value of kindness doesn't appear in any of them. Um, and if you think about kindness in business, we certainly need to aspire to that more. And so if there were, if there was more kindness in business, would you, for instance, have plastic in the seas? Would zero hours contracts exist, for instance? Would there be a gender pay gap? Um, so I think the answer is, uh, is, and as Jules hinted at, is to carry on keep being kind essentially and that is something I've definitely struggled with because my reaction to that situation that you just described Tessa certainly in years gone by would have been a very different reaction which would have been yeah you know, sort of teetering on revenge really <laughs> but so so the journey is is important so the, the kindness thing is an aspiration and whether we we can be you know we, whether we can be kind all the time 100% consistently is 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 the question and whether we can solve all conflicts is is a question as well if i i'm, I'm not an expert and i hope i haven't presented myself as such and certainly i've leaned on a lot of experts like ash and jules um but if i get conflict right 51 percent of the time that'll be a massive improvement so that will be my aspiration and i think the same can be said of, 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 of kindness yeah I'll just jump in on the second half of the question, actually, if I may, in terms of the, you know, the cutthroat behavior as well, I've never thankfully seen it from people that I've helped get there as it were, but I think one would have to try and identify why, what would be the triggers to cause somebody to behave in that way. And I've certainly seen colleagues who've behaved like this and I, I have no time for people who aren't collaborative. Um, and I think if you, if you have people that you're trying to bring on and giving people voices and encouraging people to try and then you know supporting them and protecting them if they make mistakes because you're encouraging them to innovate and foster that culture of collaboration and and innovation then you know you'll find how loyal people can be and it's staggering how you know people will do the right thing always for the team and trying to inculcate in them that that team of teams culture of thinking of others rather than themselves and, and team incentives rather than individual incentives and, and you can see as across different sectors the way behaviors are driven quite often by the way people are incentivized um you know i, I remember you know, what a lot of hierarchies obviously in military and government the senior people are supposed to be the most experienced and therefore their voices count more for, than those um you know, in the junior ranks as it were um, but the number of organizations i've joined both in business and in government where you're told okay welcome to the team you know you're new so it's going to take probably about six months before you understand us before what you have to say is going to be really valuable and the trouble is with that mentality that might be the six months where they start drinking the kool-aid and by the time they understand you they've forgotten what it was that they saw with fresh eyes that could change everything for the better so i always try and make sure that from the first day we get a new joiner that we hear from them how they think and what might be different because that's so valuable and making people feel valued is, is key to this, I think. Okay, um, lots of comments coming through. Brilliant advice um, from both Jules and Ash and Michael. What would you say was your biggest mistake in conflict negotiation and how could, should you have avoided it? It's a bit of a leading question. Are you happy to answer that? Oh God, yeah, I know mine because I've never quite forgiven myself for it. Um, <laughs> I was in Iraq and one of the things that my job was to uh, help Iraqi women become included in the process. And they, they had, there was this governing council um, which was set up in the interim before elections could be held. And there was a group of women who wanted to argue for 50% representation on that group. An entirely reasonable proposition as a gender split. I knew at the time that that was no way near what was being talked about in terms of other quotas and I tried to manipulate the group. I was very young uh, and I was, I was genuinely doing it, I thought to do the best thing, but actually I really was trying to set the room up in a way that only one person could speak and I knew that her views were slightly more closer, were closer to what others were talking about, by others I mean the guys. And, and it all blew up where they basically turned around and absolutely called me on it and said, you are trying to stop me, me and me, uh, you know, this lady, this lady and this lady from speaking. 
and it's because you are trying to to gag us and gag our views and and I you know when you've just been absolutely caught out and I've never ever tried to manipulate a situation ever again um you can be very you know you've got to bring views together you can't hide them and I had tried to hide them I, admittedly I was genuinely I was trying to do what I thought was the best thing but I hadn't empathized I hadn't taken the different perspective and I'd actually been incredibly crass and rude trying to cover up somebody else's opinion and as you can probably tell I'm very embarrassed and ashamed by that I'm glad you've shared it with us all in front of an audience though Joe. <laughs> well you've got to learn right you've got to learn you've got we didn't cover that bit in the book <laughs> oh no but you know we all mess up we all mess up <laughs> I think that's going to be my point. The Iraqi women, because they are, whew, they will tell you, and rightly so. I imagine. I'll, we'll we'll cover that in. I don't agree too, Jules. Thank you. <laughs> well, what about Ash? Have you got anything to add? Yeah, there was. Well, there's one which I handled very poorly um, for the right reasons, but in the wrong way. Um, there'd been a big attack um, in Afghanistan in Kabul. Um, a big bomb at the gate of a a compound, an international compound, that had killed a number of people. And then the terrorists had entered the compound to try and kill the Westerners inside. And the locals who I was training and supporting, um, we reacted to it and went to the scene. And it was all quite busy. A lot of shooting, a lot of explosions and, and stuff. And, uh, you know, a colleague of mine had just been shot dead just standing next to me. So emotions were quite high. And then I'd heard that the senior local general had turned up. He shouldn't have been there, but there's this sort of eight-year-old football desire to be the one chasing the football. So they all just descend uh, beast of the honeypot. And I went to find him and saw him as a very senior officer priming a grenade, about to throw a grenade over the wall, with, and his press officer was there to take photos of it. And, and like a, you know, Jules disarming her children of the, the unicorn that they're fighting over, I took the grenade out of his hand and said, what the hell do you think you're doing, basically? Um, and in front of all his, his people. So I embarrassed him, and you know, that's not a good thing to do in, in a culture like that. Um, but I did it for the right reasons because he was about to throw it over the wall where I knew there were people which he didn't know on our side were on that on that other side of the wall and he would have killed or injured our people. So, um, you know, there was definitely a tension after that. And then I'd heard, you know, anecdotally from others, you know, just check your vehicle when you come to the compound from now on because we hear that he might have got a contract on you because you embarrassed him so much. And it's, oh, God. But long story short, um, we talked about it and I explained that he'd been doing such a great job and it was things like that that would have completely undermined his own credibility as the leader, blah, blah, blah. And it got to the point in a big meeting where he was acting a bit funny when he came in and then in front of everybody, he said, right, I realise there's been some discussion and I got something very wrong at this particular attack and I recognise that I should have done this, this and this. And I immediately jumped on the back of that and said, that's you know, very insightful general and backed him up because he was quite vulnerable then. And I knew from that moment that we would be sort of I say lifelong friends, but we, you know, the relationship was inseparable after that because he he'd recognised and we'd done it in a way that he was able to get his pride back without, you know, me getting blown up. Thankfully. And then you moved to Australia. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm in quarantine. Yeah. Yes, yeah. indeed, indeed. Well, well, everybody, I think we've we've basically come up to our hour. So there we go. Yeah of all the questions which I think I'm going to ask the panel to sort of respond to sort of outside of the meeting. Um, I just want to sort of summarise and say thank you so much for a really insightful discussion today. I think what we can take away from this is that we we learn at our mother's knee how to be confrontational and then spend the rest of our lives trying to be better people and I think if we all buy your book Michael I'm sure it could be it'll help us along the way. So really advertising for it. Thank you very much. So thank you everyone for joining us. And uh, yes, we'll be sending you the video with all the links uh, in a day or so. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us, Tessa. Thanks. Thank you, Jules. Thanks, Ash.